Good morning, folks. Here we are again. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to miss two Sundays in a row of having worship together in our sanctuary. But uh, due to the icy and clement weather, couldn't really tell what it would be like in the morning. We've had to cancel again this Sunday. But I hope you're all well and safe. The Lord be with you on this, the Lord's Day. It is the sixth Sunday of our season of Epiphany. It's actually the last Sunday of our season of Epiphany. On Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent uh, with our Ash Wednesday service. Hope you'll join us. That's at 7 o'clock. We'll be live streaming this service. And uh, hopefully you received a letter with ashes enclosed uh, to use during this service. I'm uh, going to read this morning our text, lectionary text for the day. It's from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 40 through 45. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And he sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to the people. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in the country, and people came to him from every quarter. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Back in 1989, when I first entered the ministry at Lincoln Park United Methodist Church in Reading, Pennsylvania, it was near the height of the AIDS epidemic in America. Nearly 30,000 deaths were reported alone in that year. Having been assigned to work with the missions committee, I was part of a small group of volunteers who would visit the Rainbow House twice a month, an AIDS hospice that was located on the campus of the Wernersville State Hospital. There we would both prepare and serve meals to the residents most of whom were unfortunately too sick to get out of bed, but there were several uh, who would come down to the dining room and uh, again, we'd have the opportunity to serve them and converse with them. While I had a pretty good idea even then about how AIDS was transmitted, I can still remember several things. First of how careful I was, I recall being of navigating that space in that small kitchen and dining room, making sure that I was uh, keeping a safe social distance from the residents. And how to my own shame, I can still remember having an almost visceral reaction, even feeling, even uh, again, I'm embarrassed to say, repulsed by some of uh, the residents there who are now in the latter stages of that disease whose bodies were now uh, quite emaciated, their skin slackened and ashen in tone. Driving home alone, I can remember uh, reprimanding myself for having such feelings, imagining how the hospice residents uh, must have detected my fear by my distance, even maybe a slight judgment in my eyes and how that must have made them feel. If you've ever been the one who's been uh, sick with a virus or an infectious disease, some of you may remember, as I recall, having been quarantined um, 
when I had the chicken pox and mumps uh, from the rest of my family uh, confined to my bedroom. Or maybe some of you, uh, as a little bit older as adults, maybe having shingles and kind of keeping yourself separate from the rest of the family. Maybe even for some of you, the COVID-19 virus. Or maybe with some people, uh, some of us have experienced even mental illness or other sicknesses that have had a social stigma attached to it. If you've ever had this kind of experience, then you will be able to empathize uh, with those who have uh, gone through long periods um, with the absence of human touch uh, or intimate human relationships, community. In the first century, during the time of Jesus, there existed a, a hierarchy or a caste system of sorts um, expressed even in the architecture of the temple in the city of Jerusalem. At the top of the hierarchy, within the center of um, the temple was the Holy of Holies, the place uh, where it was believed that God resided. And then outside of the Holy of Holies was the court of the priests, those who were thought to be uh, the closest to God, who were there to perform the daily rituals of worship. And outside of the court of the priest was the, uh, the court of, um, of uh, the Jewish men, where they alone could gather and worship. And then outside of the court of the Jewish men was the court of the women, the Jewish women, again, who alone could meet in this section of the temple uh, to worship. Outside the court of the women was the it was called the Court of the Gentiles, or Solomon's Porch, again, where non-Jews could gather and worship God. And then uh, beyond the walls of the temple, but yet within the city of Jerusalem, uh, was the place for what we'll call the irreligious, uh, the secularists. Uh, maybe today we might call them the nuns or the duns. And then even further, banished outside of the city gates of Jerusalem were those on the lowest rung of the ladder, the lowest within the caste, those known as the unclean and untouchables, including lepers, which we, we know included all kinds of skin uh, ailments, including uh, what we would call today maybe eczema, eczema or psoriasis, but also what we uh, call today, or what is known as Hansen's disease, um, caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium leprae. Uh, that can affect the nerves, skin, the eyes, the lining of the nose, and over prolonged periods, as some of us have witnessed, can even cause uh, deformities and disability. Back in the 1980s, I read a book by Mother Teresa, or actually it was about Mother Teresa, and even at that time, in the uh, early 1980s, there were more than a two and a half million people in India uh, with Hansen's disease, leprosy. Mother Teresa, in that book that I read, told the story of a well-to-do businessman who one day came home to his wife with the tragic news that he had contracted leprosy. Fearing for her life and for her daughter, uh, who now they would not be able to find a, uh, uh, a suitor uh, for marriage, um, she sent her husband from their home. The Sisters of Charity found him as uh, destitute and even suicidal in the streets of Calcutta. And then um, before taking him to a, a leper colony uh, where he found a home and began uh, producing hand-spun linen and clothing and lived uh, for, for a period of time when the book was written with a fairly happy and productive life. While leprosy is now curable, more than 130,000 people in India still contract this disease every year, with many still due to fear and social stigma being forced to live in isolation 
in more than 700 lepre, uh, leper colonies throughout that nation. In the days of Jesus, according to the purity laws in the book of Leviticus, whenever coming near uh, public, lepers were required, first of all, to remain uh, 50 paces uh, away for those who were considered to be clean. And in order to identify themselves, they were to wear uh, torn clothing and to leave their hair uh, uncombed, which sounds a lot like our youth today. And if you've seen some of the jeans they're wearing, uh, they're both torn and, and uh, holy. And um, concerning uncombed hair, uh, what's up with Boris Johnson, the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? Have you seen his hair? Uh, his uncombed hair. Uh, I mean, the guy's 56 years old. I'm not quite sure what he has going on there. But what's interesting is that earlier, still in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, verse 6, wearing torn clothing and leaving one's hair uncombed was also a sign that you were mourning, that you were grieving the death uh, of someone, of a loved one. But in this case, the lives that the lepers were mourning, their torn clothing and uncombed hair, the lives that they were grieving, now living cut off in isolation from their families in leper colonies, the life they were grieving was their own. They were literally looked upon in society as part of the living dead. You may remember the Old Testament book of 2 Kings in the story of Naaman, the Syrian uh, military leader, who was sent by the king of Aram to Joram, the king of Israel, with a letter asking the king of Israel to heal Naaman of his leprosy. The king of Israel, we read, tears his clothing and uh, asks those within the king's court Am I a God to give death or life that this man sends me word to cure this man of leprosy? To have leprosy in Jesus' time was to be considered unclean, one of the untouchables. It was to be one of the living dead. But while Joram, the king of Israel, did not have the power to heal Naaman of his leprosy, to restore him from death to life, we read this morning that there is a prophet in Israel, like the prophet Elijah in the book of 2 Kings, who does actually then uh, help to heal Naaman. There is one now who is moving about uh, the region of Galilee, teaching uh, in the synagogues and healing. And as we read this morning, a leper comes up to him, breaks the, the uh, social distancing rules, but kneels before Jesus and pleads with him, uh, saying, if you will, you can make me clean. And I like how uh, it's read in J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament. Jesus responds, of course I want to be clean. Not all of Jesus' healing stories in the Gospels include uh, Jesus reaching out to touch the person that he's healing. In many cases, he merely says the word and the people are healed. But also, in, in a number of cases, particularly in healing the deaf and the blind, in healing a leper here in Mark's Gospel, and in healing those like Jairus' daughter, who are believed to be dead, it appears that human touch is necessary in the healing process. The Greek word to be made clean is catharsthete. And it's where we get the English word, maybe you hear it in there, catharsis. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about having a cathartic experience, maybe when you get a massage or um, I don't know, but it's more than just a uh, um, 
healing of a physical, in a physical sense, but rather it is the healing of the anxieties or the emotions that are um, around one's physical infirmity. Sometimes the deeper hurt or wound that needs healing or cleansing is not really our bodies, but the emotional trauma that has accompanied or accompanies our infirmity or our illness. Uh, when I was a young boy around nine years of age, I was cutting through the backyard uh, shortcut of a neighbor and ran around the corner of uh, his home only to run directly into him. And uh, he was there with his dog on his leash. And as the dog was chewing on my uh, leg, he reminded me that I, that he had warned me never to cut through his backyard. Well, having gone to the hospital to get a tetanus shot and have my wounds uh, rinsed out, cleaned out, uh, eventually they would heal, but I still have uh, dreams or memories of that traumatic experience to this day. While having leprosy, more than his physical concerns, um, we recognize in the healing of this leper that this may have been uh, the first time, again, having been abandoned by his family and his community, this may have been the first time that he had experienced human touch in a number of years. Author Frederick Beekner writes, through simply touching more directly than in any other way, we can transmit to each other something of the power of the life we have inside of us. It's no wonder that just the touch of another human being at a dark time can be enough to save the day. We can never underestimate the power of human touch. Uh, Jesus reaches out and filled with compassion, reaches out and touches the leper. True healing, true cleansing, well, it takes into consideration the body, really entails the soul, the whole person. And reaching out and touching the leper, Jesus reaches across his feelings of abandonment, of alienation, of isolation, and restores him uh, to his self, his true self, telling him to go and show himself to the priests in the temple who alone in that day were able uh, to authorize that one was uh, healed or whole, which then would allow him to be restored uh, to his family and community. This leper who was once one of the living dead, now through Christ, had been made alive again. His mourning uh, turned to dancing he is uh, so exuberant uh, that he seems incapable of heeding Jesus' words to go and tell no one, but rather we read he goes and shares with everyone, anyone who will listen to him, um, this good news about one who has restored him uh, to life, um, to wholeness. So over the last three Sundays, uh, of this season of Epiphany, we have witnessed Jesus as one, again, who teaches and preaches with authority, as one also who heals, who casts out demons, the uh, minions of evil who are always trying to throw something across Jesus' path to oppose or to hinder him from bringing the kingdom of God on earth, from bringing the kingdom of God to people within. We watched Jesus begin his teaching. We watched him begin this ministry of, of teaching and preaching and healing first in the Jewish synagogue, or we'll, may we say within the church, uh, uh, our own life together. And then it's extended out uh, to Peter's home, where remember he heals Peter's mother-in-law and all those who come to Peter's door. This 
teaching, preaching, and healing ministry extends out from the church into the family, into the, the home, and into the community. And then today we, we read that Jesus' ministry, the kingdom of God, is expanded uh, to those who live on the margins of life, to those uh, who are cast out of the city, outcasts, the untouchables, the unclean. And we were reminded uh, once again uh, that the kingdom of God is for all, that God's will is that all might be healed, that all might be well, that all might be saved. Here we witness again that while evil and sickness are everywhere, we are never beyond the reach of God. And that's good news. This is the good news, for the truth is that all of us are unclean. That all of us suffer or suffer others from some known sin, some impurity, some imbalance, some imperfection in our own lives, which have the effect of alienating others, of isolating um, ourselves um, from one another, even within our marriages, uh, within our relationships with our children, uh, within our relationships uh, amongst siblings and friends, uh, we all have imbalances, imperfections, uh, uncleanliness that um, is in need of healing. Like the leper, uh, we would all do well to search for and to find Jesus and to kneel and to plead with him. If you haven't uh, um, had this experience, um, Maybe during the season of Lent, as we come, uh, you might recognize a need uh, to come to him, to come to Christ in humility and to plead, uh, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Then to wait um, with the hope that Jesus might reach out and uh, touch us and that we might hear the words, of course I want to, be clean. Every year around Easter time, uh, they play one of my favorite movies uh, of all time, uh, Ben-Hur, starring Charlton Heston. Um, if you haven't, I invite you to watch it if you have a chance. At the end of that movie, Ben-Hur, who has become a, a famous chariot driver in the Colosseum of Rome, has returned home to Jerusalem to find that his mother and sister have contracted leprosy. Learning that Jesus is in the city, he attempts to take them to Jesus to be healed, but it's too late. Uh, Jesus has already been tried and now is in the process of being crucified. Pierced in his side, the blood of Christ flowing out from his body down the cross as it begins to rain, it enters into a healing stream that flows from the bottom of the cross or from Christ's own body down to the bottom of the cross, down uh, to the bottom of Golgotha's hill where the leper colony is located. And here in these waters, uh, Ben-Hur's mother and sister are healed, uh, are made well again, reminding us that there is power in the blood. There is power in the life of Christ to make us clean, to make the wounded whole. That there is a fountain that flows, still flows for you and me, this is the good news uh, here on this last Sunday of Epiphany as we stand before the season of Lent. Uh, there is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's graves, grave. And um, 
I think that's how it goes. <laughs> uh, and all who fall beneath uh, this flood um, uh, has removed all their guilty stains. Uh, look it up. All right, well, blessings to you. Uh, prayers um, for this, the Lord's Day. So be it. Amen.